Morally, the concept of persons, personhood, is generally addressed by philosophers. Um, I want to ask you, as a psychiatrist, as someone who has dealt with Alzheimer's, when you see the destruction of personhood, uh, how, how do you reflect on, on the components of what it means to be a person? The, the issue of personhood in Alzheimer's is now uh, risen to the top. Uh, it, traditionally, we thought someone who lost their cognitive abilities, who was uh, either not self-aware of the decisions they were making, who were not able to sort of make executive decisions in a manner that sort of someone without Alzheimer's could make, someone whose memories were destroyed to the point where they were not able to recognize other people. The thinking is that maybe that person is somehow less of a person than a person whose cognitive abilities are intact. And we used to sort of treat them in a very generic manner when they were in nursing homes. They were kind of, uh, uh, it's almost like you never asked the person what they wanted. You always pay attention to what the spouse or the informant mm -hmm. wants. Mm -hmm. The doctor would often prescribe antipsychotic or tranquilizer medications to the Alzheimer's person based on what the nurse was saying rather than based on what the person was saying. Because but they considered consider that no longer a person. Exactly, or less of a person, less if you will. Uh, so the neuroscience definition of a person is, is taking over more and more and more. And, and several neuroscientists now have proposed 14 criteria, and I expect those criteria to grow to maybe 20 criteria by which, you know, if they don't meet all of these criteria, you're no longer a person. Or, or is it a kind of a pro rata percentage on what percentage? Maybe. We, we haven't, nobody has come what to... What are some of these uh, criteria? Uh, we'll get I'll to that. I'll see if I fit them. But we'll get to that. But I think the important thing to realize is in Europe now, yeah. they realize that if you give more individuality to Alzheimer's patients. They actually created a village in Netherlands, a whole village that would mimic the early childhood village where so many of these Alzheimer's patients grew up, where every patient was given their own home. They were allowed to wander into cinema theaters. They were allowed to wander into, into barber shops, into ice cream stores. In each of these so-called venues, they had sales staff, but the sales staff were actually nurses who were sort of disguised as actual sales staff because they want to facilitate the Alzheimer's patient's experience as an individual to do all the things they ever did. And they found that the moment an Alzheimer's patient is put in that setting, they're calmer, they don't need as much antipsychotic medication, their disease progression's a little slower. So, so I think the U.S., is starting to sort of watch those experiments. And now what you're seeing in the U.S. is more nursing homes and more senior centers are going to sort of treat the Alzheimer's patient as individuals. And so their dignity, their self-respect, uh, their wishes are going to be taken and given higher consideration. What are some of these uh, criteria that could uh, define personhood? So, so these criteria uh, have just been proposed by individuals. Uh, they are not yet, to my knowledge, consensual criteria uh, from, you know, like an accredited neuroscience body. So at the core of these criteria, I would say, are uh, things such as cognitive processes, IQ. Uh, so cognitive processes, your memory has to be intact. Your ability to sort of uh, process information perception has to be intact. Self-awareness has to be intact. So for example, if you can't recognize faces or separate two people's faces, mm -hmm. if you had a stroke and say the fusiform gyrus, which destroyed your ability to recognize faces, maybe you're a little, you get a little less points. The most controversial is IQ. One scientist proposed that anyone with an IQ less than 40 is less of a person. And if their IQ is less than 20, they're not a person. And, and, and I feel like we're going back to the old days, uh, which is kind of dangerous. You know, in the old days, not everybody was considered an equal person because we all know, you know, the dark history where right. slaves, for example, were right. considered property. They were not considered persons. Right. Right. And so I think it's very, very critical we don't use neuroscience in a bad way to go back to those sort of days where we are arbitrarily saying based on neuroscience criteria whether someone's a full person, a partial person, or not a person. I don't think we should go there. I think, I think we can learn from neuroscience the mechanisms by which we feel that we are a person, that we feel we're an individual. And I think there are ways we can use that to encourage social networking, empathy, compassion. I think that's a good direction to go to allow people to flourish. It's a bad direction to go to say someone's not a person. Everyone's a person in their own way. <laughs> uh, how important is, the, is personhood in, uh, in, uh, in psychiatry today? So personhood is critically important in one field of psychiatry called forensic psychiatry, 
It's also, I think, going to be very critical in uh, child psychiatry because uh, increasingly as children getting into trouble, uh, you know, whatever, you know, the question is, can a child's brain make all the decisions that an adult brain makes? We're starting to see in some states, you know, children even potentially getting the death sentence or whatever. Ultimately, you know, let's say neuroscience improves to the point in 20 years. We have far better skills. Right now with brain scans, people are already starting to identify the sort of the personhood circuit in the brain. Or well, gross abnormalities that would undermine that. Right. Well, so, so they're taking all kinds of studies that show, for example, how do we make judgments about people? Uh, how do we recognize faces? How do, what are the circuits involved in perception? And they're tying together all these and trying to come up with the so-called personhood circuit. Yeah. Uh, our tools right now are crude. Let's imagine 50 years from now, we had the most sophisticated brain scan and we could completely map every change. And let's say you went out, bought a gun, and you shot 50 people. And then I did these brain scans and I said, these brain scans show massive alterations in your personhood circuit. What is the, uh, how is that going to change psychiatry? How is that going to change law? How is that going to change the way we hold individuals responsible? Yeah, that's very... Because currently neuroscience says our acts are predetermined by circuits in the brain. So you, when you deal with personhood, you get into free will, you get into free will, you get into moral responsibility, Correct. and it's a slippery slope. It's a completely and, slippery slope. Right. You know, so it, the neuroscience is a tremendous asset, but there are dangers as it's well. It's a double-edged sword. You have to be careful, just like genetics. We went through genetics, and then we went through eugenics, and now we're trying to, again, get back to where we can harness genetics for good things. And I think neuroscience is the same way. We're going to, you know, as sort of the uh, mania over neuroscience, if it will, reaches a boiling point, there may be some unintended harmful consequences, and then eventually we'll find a balance where we can help society.